yeah. was trying to have a conversation. Yeah. Except we can't because we're constantly interrupted. So yeah. we've decided to keep that and not edit that out. Just That's to have it as part of, of it. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you set Wasafiri up in 1984? 84 was it? 84, that's right. Um, and it means traveller? Yeah, traveler? it's... Uh, well, when I first set it up, it was um, 1984. It was set up in Britain. Um, we chose the name Wasafiri from the Swahili word for travellers, actually, okay. which is a kind of hybrid of the Arabic safari. And every, everybody kept saying, oh, you're mad. What are you, why are you choosing this funny name, Wasa what, Wasa? know for, an, for a literary magazine but we chose it because of the notion of cultural traveling and the idea of translation so in a sense we deliberately chose a non-English word and it was also an important political moment at that time I mean it's all changed now and in fact in the session I went to a bit earlier which was imaginary homelands they were talking about you know is everybody now dislocated is, is every writer does every writer have multiple identities and so on but when we set up Wasafiri, it, and it was in the context of Britain particularly, writers from African, Caribbean, Asian, so-called, as they called it then, ethnic minority backgrounds, were not really getting reviewed or read in the press enough. Or if they were, they were read in a kind of anthropological way. And they were not, not a part, part of, the of English literature. Also, they were not a part of curricula. No, in, in, no they, weren't being, they weren't being taught. Um, I'd, Wasafiri came out of an organization before that that was a, I guess it was a political pressure group to get them onto the A-level, you know, the sixth form syllabus. So to read, I don't know, Jean Rees or V.S. Naipaul or whatever, just to get kids to think about other ways of looking at the world. You know. um, with travelers, I mean, that's, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting choice of, uh, but what, how did that link up with the initial idea? I mean, was it because most of the writers who were writing in English and who were not either American or English were not living in their countries of origin as well? Like, say, someone like Naipaul, they were mostly writers in exile? They were, at so that point, I would say, they were mostly writers in exile. They were migrant writers now, diasporic writers, or writers interested in using in, at that point, we were mainly publishing writing in English, although now we publish writing in translation. But using language as a way of transporting one across worlds. And they weren't only English writers. I mean, we, were pub we, we published people like Chinua Achebe, you know, who was not living in England. Um, and it was a kind of international group. But the prime emphasis was to give this space for this writing that was coming up in Britain, second, third generation migrants. Yeah. Like you mentioned, a lot has changed yeah. um, in the scene itself, in, in, in the, the landscape uh, that you chose to uh, you know, be a part of. How much has changed and how much remains the same? Well, that's interesting. Um, I think a lot has changed in the sense that now if you talk about a writer who is you know, someone like, I guess, uh, who's in the kind of more of the mainstream, um, I don't know, say, say Romesh Gurdjieff because of the Booker Prize, who's not that well known, but he's Sri Lankan, living in Britain, got shortlisted for the Booker Prize in, in 95, I think it was. Um, if you mention someone like that, people will know the name and they won't think it's so strange to be talking about these writers as contemporary literature. Whereas before, you know, you could go to a party and I would say the kind of people I was reading and people would just look at you, as if you, who, who are these people, why are you, why are you doing it? Um, I suppose what's changed is that publishers have seen that it's a good marketing ploy, they can sell that these writers work and that most of these writers are, or a lot of them are some of the best writers writing at the moment. What hasn't changed is that there's still a lot of ignorance in the press, so certain names get pushed forward like when um, there's a writer called Zadie Smith, whom I'm sure you must know, um, who wrote a book called White Teeth and when that first came out I think because Salman Rushdie wrote a little blurb on the back and she came, went from Cambridge everyone said oh this is the first immigrant you know multicultural novel about Britain it's complete rubbish there have been you know writers in the 50s writers in the 30s but they weren't seen they, they were sort of pigeonholed into particular 
traditions. Um, and I've just been doing a, just recently doing a project for three years on Asians in Britain um, from 1870 to 1950 because the myth is that it all started after 1945, after the Second World War and after independence and partition and the big economic migration. But of course, there were many writers and intellectuals in Britain from India or from the subcontinent in the 30s and before. So we've been looking at these radicals and writers in that period and looking at the way they were dealing with quite a few similar issues to the ones we're talking about now when we're talking about migration, but they didn't have those words, you know, on it. So it's interesting. That is very interesting, actually. Yeah. The, the so Mukhraj Anand and these kind of people who, was, who, who kind of had a, a vision whether right or wrong, of a kind of global humanism, a sea of stories, this kind of idea, the idea of vernacular la roots across language between writers, cosmopolitanism. He was talking about all those things. Even though England and America are not dominating the English writing, in fact, a lot of people, lot of people would say that, I mean, they were saying, it may be an exaggeration, but that India had become yeah. the English writing, uh, you know. Sort of the hub of the world, of the world. yeah. yeah. Um, but having said all that, uh, it's something that you mentioned even earlier that it's still filtered in a, through to us yeah. through um, uh, say uh, in, in approval from from England or from America in in terms of I don't know how many people would have heard of even an Oran Pamuk in say in India yeah. uh, had it not been for the Nobel Prize yeah. or um, how many people would have uh, you know heard of Vikram Seth in India had it not been had it not gone know, the other way yes, first yes. yeah so yeah. Th there is that whole uh, thing that we're still it's still about the Booker not even so much about the Pulitzer it is a lot about the Booker it is about well the Nobel Prize in a sense it's it's about uh, English you know advances in the UK it's about having an English agent in India in Pakistan and all these and and that is um, is that something that 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 uh, that should be of concern, or do you think that that's something that's going to ease out, um, uh, you know, its next step? Well, I hope it does ease out and that it becomes more balanced and that there are these literary prizes that have equal status elsewhere. Sure. That would be my ideal vision, sure. because I think otherwise you do then, you know, because of the way the publishing industry works in Britain, it's quite an elite, you know, as you, know, you would expect, it is still quite an elitist group. And even Wasafiri, which is highly regarded, you know, I meet literary agents who, who might capture some of the kind of writers you've been mentioning, but they are, you know, often on their list. They don't have very many of these writers and they don't know the range of writing that's out there. You know, it kind of, t that's what I meant earlier, that, that one person like Aaron Dutai Roy or whoever gets picked on. Exactly, so. it's filtered through that. that, that and then they process. become the new thing. And I remember like, he went out and, I think it was when Aaron Dutai won the book, uh, someone rang me up you know, on the radio and said, oh, is this the new Salman Rushdie and will you talk? And I said, no, I'm not talking. And certainly not of that sort of question. <laughs> Where does more writing need to come from? What, is there still writing that needs to be highlighted and become... Where is ne neglected writing today? Where would you go to look for it? Well, I think... Some of the, I suppose one of the things Wasafir has always, always tried to do is to sort of uh, do these special issues where we, we start exploring new areas. And uh, one of them is... We're looking at Eastern European writing, you know, there's a lot of migration from Eastern Europe into Britain, different kinds of stories of migration. We're look, we, looked, we did an issue on Chinese writing, we've been making connections between Jewish and, um, say, post-colonial writing. Um, and we'd like to do something on, on um, really on areas that I haven't really hit um, the mainstream where, where you have, I suppose we would have to work in translation because that's obviously you can't access the language you can't read. So um, we are, we're looking at Latin American stuff, um, just trying to explore it really. Um, so when we're moving away from just simply being English language publication. Um, there's also new stories, I mean the stories are changing all the time um, in terms of also what was black British writing. We've just done a new issue of the new black British writing, you know, so the debates are shifting all the time um, as the generations change. Sure. So, sure. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, and I guess there'll be graphic novels, you know, there's all this with the e-internet e stuff, different kinds of format and form, I guess. Yeah.
Yeah, and there's more room for uh, experimentation. And, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. The other thing that I wanted to ask you is, um, uh, like we spoke, the context of publishing and writing has changed arguably more in the last decade or so than in a in a really long long time. A lot of changes have come into place. A lot of um, what is the how have the concerns and the relevance of literary criticism evolved in the last decade or so? Um, in, in terms of the kind of writing we publish, yes. yeah. Um, I think, peop as I said before, I think people are better informed about what they're doing. But I think you still find, you know, in the Times Literary Supplement or the London Review Books or whatever, that, um, you know, a friend of mine is a was one of the first black publishers in Britain. She's quite well known, Margaret Busby. She always says, and she, you know, she can review anything. Why is it that I always get sent the black novel or the African novel to review? Why don't I get sent any, you know, any new book? So there's still that, that, oh, this critic should know about it because of the color of their skin or because, you know, their roots or, or something. So, so there's an attempt, I think, now to kind of, among some groups, to break those kinds of compartments. Um, and you still find, every now and then, you do find, you know, ill-informed critics making nonsensical comments, you know, or utter, utter, utter cliched kind of comments on sort of orientalism, of orientalism getting, and, yeah. and, and, and the exoticizing of the yeah. East. It's still going, you know, it still happens. Yeah. Um, but it's better, I think, Words like Orientalism, words like diaspora, words like migrant have started coming into the critical, the mainstream critical vocabulary so that people, and I guess that's one of the things that Wasafiri has done, is made that shift in how people think happen. But outside of Wasafiri and outside of the kind of work you publish, do you think that criticism is um, keeping up with the experimentation, the changes in form and content? Um, in writing and um, sort of challenging itself to read books in a in a new way because I, I constantly find certain phrases and certain cliches repeated in the best of uh, criticism that one reads. Um, I'm not sure that it is, I mean I think it got you know in the 80s it got very very influenced by theory and I think it's still got to break out of that I mean, the, the, the kind of post-colonial mindset or the post-modern mindset all that language and jargon which we try to keep out of Wasafiri's pages is still there because I suppose the generation of critics who are writing probably grew up with it. Um, and I, I, I still feel the people who write the best or write the best criticism are the ones who do not get sucked into that. And I think there's a move now towards a kind of, not exactly anti-theory, but sort of to try and demythologize and break out of the stereotypes which become equally equally as limiting as the, what you had before with the kind of right-wing, kind of canonical sure. view. So. You know, um, post-colonialism is again a term that post-modernism perhaps needs to be preserved for... for, for but does, does post-colonialism have any relevance as a term or should it just be outlawed now? I think it has some relevance when you're teaching students about history. Who don't know anything That's even about colonization? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, um, but I think increasingly it's it's become fairly useless because it's been overused, and it's and it links people together from such different histories, from such different um, regions, and it, it becomes a kind of imperializing thing all over again. So I think it's much better to get rid of it, really. Yes, it's again the same thing. It's defining. You know, it's defining it against yes. against the co yes, colonial, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, finally, Sushila, what you've done, you've been at this for 25 years. Um, is it challenging to do the same thing you've you've done over 25 years to find, you know, to remain excited, to remain energized? How's that process been personally? Well, I mean, in these times, there are very few people who do the same I thing. I know, but I don't know. It seems incredible. I can't believe it actually when I think about it, but. Um, Partly it's been through the Wasafiri board, who are a very lively group of writers and critics who've supported it and we have debates and so on. And right now, in fact, we are always changing ourselves. We haven't just stayed one thing. And 
we, you know, we, we've just been discussing what is it now that makes us distinctive. In a sense, we've done our job. We've put this stuff in the mainstream. We've, you know, we've made told the made it clear that it's the whole story we're telling, not just a part of the story and all, all of these kinds of debates. But I think what makes it exciting is just the writing, really, seeing what people are doing and finding new writers and the excitement about getting published. Um, and somehow the sense that it's reassuring that, you know, even with our new writing prize, that I think one or two of the writers we've had have gone on to win other prizes. So somewhere in that judging process we did find someone who was new and good. Sure. Sure. Is there something else that you'd like to do if you were... Um, I want to do my own writing. <laughs> that that, that yeah. must, it must have taken a toll on that. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it has shifted to being the magazine of international contemporary writing. That's been a, a, a shift. Um, and I'd like it to become, I suppose I, I'd like it to become seen you know, if I was being very ambitious, not exactly like something like Granta, but more in that way, so that it's not just something that's seen as a kind of political weapon to make a point. I mean, in a sense, we're not trying to make a political point anymore. Sure. It's made. It's made, yeah. Great, Sashina. Is that okay? That's, yeah. that's perfect. Okay. Thank you.